I'm a, an ecologist, interdisciplinary ecologist, and I always have a hard time to explain tree migration, what it means, when they ask me. Uh, so I'm going to try to talk a, lot of, a little bit about this today. I split my time between IPAM, this Brazilian NGO, uh, doing work in the interface between policy and science, and uh, work outside the Woods Hole Research Center. So before I start, I'd like to, to thank a lot of people who are part of this work, especially Marcia Macedo. She was not here today. She was supposed to be here, uh, but she has a Fulbright. is in Brazil right now, uh, moving on our work there. So as many has uh, shown, this is where we work most of the time. Uh, and this map shows uh, one of the largest, the world's largest uh, agriculture from there. If uh, the world decides that it's going to keep uh, demanding um, meat and soybean, uh, by default, this is where uh, most of the change may happen. Uh, the different colors represent different crops. And this in red here is just the amount of fire that there is in the landscape. So we've been talking a lot about the deforestation uh, for the expansion of um, uh, pasture and, and soybean fields or croplands. But it comes also with other effects that may influence uh, the, uh, the dynamics of tropical forests. And then here today, I'm going to try to address two questions. Uh, one, a lot with my work with IPAM and Marcia, that it's can the expansion of cropping system influence deforestation rates? And it's a lot of the issue of uh, sparing land uh, by increasing productivity. And the other, what's the role of agriculture expansion in intensification in, in modifying forest disturbance regimes, especially this drought-induced mortality and also fires in the landscape. So to understand the first question, so how uh, can agriculture intensification um, spare land, just a quick reminder that a lot of deforestation in the Amazon uh, is used for cattle ranching. It's about still 60 to 70 percent. In other regions, of course, this number is much lower. So this occurred a lot in the late 80s uh, and during the 90s and still occur. And, and then I have less than one head of cattle per hectare in the systems. This, for a lot of the time, occurs in lands that you don't have a tidal, so land tenure is very complex. So it's a bit invisible in the market. Uh, um, fire is a huge part of the system to use as a management tool in the system. So, um, so this is what occurred during most of my growing up in Brazil. And, and then in the 2000s, we started seeing stuff that happened in south of Brazil occurring in the Amazon, especially in the south portion of the, the basin. This is uh, accounted for 12% of direct deforestation in the early 2000s in Brazil. So forests moving from uh, from this high stature to soybean fields. And then this doesn't count the indirect effect that occurred. So in the from the 90s to the thousands, you have a new player here. But but this new player uh, depends on a lot of investments, depend on a lot of um, uh, how inserted in the global market, and so can it be influenced by other stuff. I think this is a, a figure showing that, uh, it's a figure showing uh, that this deforestation that occurred uh, reached 20% of the Amazon basin um, last year uh, was reduced, as many of you sh sh talked about, and then reaching 5,000 uh, square kilometers, uh, bounced back to 8,000 now. But why did it happen? Right? Then we, we talk a little bit about this, but then it, it has three phases, this process. One, that you have this really strong expansion of agriculture, expansion of land and cattle ranching. And then the government, the private sector, had very little to do with stopping that process because it was uh, far from this, uh, this process. Uh, we didn't have a lot of uh, legal from the government. We had the laws in place, but it didn't work very well. The forest code was there, uh, but people were clearing anyways. And then we have this second phase that is from tier, from tier governance. And then a lot of really interesting things happen here. Uh, we have a little decrease in profitability in the 2005. Uh, and then you have a herd reduction 
as well. But the government started playing a huge role. 2004 uh, creates the plan to reduce deforestation, uh, put together all the ministers to talk about this problem, and, and then uh, creates more than 90 measures to lower deforestation. So it's a huge effort from all the, the sectors working a lot of enforcement. And, and then another interesting thing happened here as the private sector got engaged, uh, creating this soil moratorium uh, that they don't buy soybean from lands that were deforested prior to 2006. And then I think we are in this third phase that uh, one of the things I want to highlight is that uh, it's not only map deforestation and, and try to uh, blame the farmer, but you try to create incentives, uh, you try to create uh, peer pressure as well, so you don't punish uh, the farmer. You also try to involve the neighbors in the municipality, so the municipality uh, is the level of the unit that you're observing this process. But it's all a very important message. But then coming back to your question, uh, did agriculture intensification was part of this solution? Did it decrease deforestation? And not the economists here, but just uh, uh, based on the observation, uh, sort of with all that happened, so in order to agriculture to lower deforestation, you have to decrease the demand for new deforestation. And this is um, go against most of the logic because increased profitability has increased uh, this agricultural that the crop plan, mechanized crop plan, and then you should um, increase land prices and that could lead to more deforestation. So you have to have a lot of things in place to avoid deforestation to expand into other places. And there are a couple of things that happen. Uh, we had establishment a lot of uh, protected areas in the in the region that remove part of the land here, so you couldn't actually expand um, croplands uh, into a lot of the areas. We did have a decrease in profitability, so maybe we didn't have efforts or incentives for new deforestation. So another thing that has to happen is that there is must be an increase in risk to those engaged in deforestation. And I think this is the risk is to have the reputation damaged. And Greenpeace, uh, the major role here in creating a campaign of zero deforestation to Amazon in 2005. I was living in Santarém during the time, and I saw a big conflict that it generated with a lot of producers. But that uh, created momentum to engage the private sector uh, to commit not to the forest. So in this sense, it seems that uh, agriculture soybean coming into this uh, picture help to reduce deforestation. And the third thing that has to happen is that there must be a reduction in the supply of undesignated land. So there is uh, still 80 million hectares of forest in Brazil without destination. So there's a lot of land speculation that has to happen. And I don't think that agriculture intensification or expansion played a major role. Uh, there's a lot of that happened here, the creation of new reserves. So you take this undesignated land and you put in the um, uh, in pool of protected areas. But it's very interesting in Mato Grosso what happened. Uh, I think Isfera showed that um, in the late 2000s, you have this increase in, in productivity, uh, soybean and also cattle, and then there's this mass, massive reduction in deforestation, 70%. Um, it saves uh, avoids 3 billion tons of CO2 being emitted to the atmosphere, one of the greatest examples of governance uh, in tropical nations. And it seems that there's a decoupling for a couple of years of deforestation and total production. That was a very positive message for the conservation community uh, to create mechanisms for compensation of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. But still, this can be seen some saying that just as you expand these agricultural fields into pasture lands, uh, at some point that is going to run out. Uh, so you have to increase the productivity of pasture lands. Otherwise, you're just buying out time. And right now, it seems that uh, this increase in deforestation is showing, showing that some of that is happening. Even though right now, for instance, deforestation, a third of deforestation actually occurs in rural settlements very small piece of land. A third occurs in like bigger uh, uh, farms, and a third everything else. But it's still a very tricky question to respond. 
especially because you may have exported deforestation to other biomes, to other continents, so it's really hard to keep track what is happening. And the studies show that part of this deforestation, reduction deforestation in Brazil, was actually offset, or the gains with the reductions in deforestation uh, were offset by an increase in deforestation that's happened. Okay, so that's the first part. Um, but then there's a very positive. If you can reduce deforestation, you end up having important effects on the just regimes of the forest by um, a stabilizing climate, by reducing fragmentation, and also uh, reducing the amount of sources of fire ignition that usually go along with the deforestation process. I won't go into details. As you clear forests, you change the climate. This is a, a tall forest in Santarém. Uh, uh, it's the Amazon. It's about 35. This tree is about 40 uh, meters tall. This is pretty dark. Uh, Evapo transpire over a meter of water a year and cools the temperature in many degrees. As others talked, as we move to the systems, uh, the edges of the systems become way more uh, uh, vulnerable or hotter. Uh, this occurs in a scale that matters to the entire region. And as, as we change the energy balance, you may expect reductions in precipitation up to 20, 30 percent, uh, depending on the region where we are. So together, the changes in climate and this edification of forests, this is just uh, in the region, in the Shingo region, 12% uh, of the forests already close to an edge. If you consider an edge 100 meters from the agricultural field into the forest, some say that uh, it has an effect over a kilometer into the forest. So you have a system that uh, if you keep clearing forests, um, you change the climate, uh, you change the boundary between edges and forests, and then you also increase the amount of edges in the landscape. All this together may create a very unstable system that can lead to very unstable conditions uh, and dieback of the forest, of this tropical forest, especially when you combine with global climate change. Uh, so there are a couple of droughts that had uh, massive impacts on the carbon of dynamic uh, of tropical forests. In the Amazon, the 2010 drought may have impact uh, two petagrams of carbon uh, just by killing a couple of trees per hectare. So just uh, trying to understand some of the tipping points of this forest when all this comes together. We have drought, we have edges, and we have fires. Uh, because when you clear, uh, you have more fires. And so we set this tropical forest in fire, on fire uh, for multiple years. And here you can see uh, that is the control, the cumulative tree mortality. And this is we burn the treatment every year and another treatment every two years and this 50 hectare plots. And then we burn, 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 nothing happens. And then we publish papers saying this nothing happened. And then there's a drought and 20% drier and three uh, degrees warmer. That is exactly what I expect to this region, the Southeast Amazon, to happen with global climate change, not even considering land use change, which by the way has increased the land, dry season length in already two weeks in this region. Uh, with this tree mortality, you have major modifications of the system with a lot of this being invaded by grasses that are very flammable, so reinforcing uh, this fire effect and uh, impoverishing this landscape. Most of this mortality occurs close to the edges because they're much hotter, and they're much drier, and you have all this wind flowing into. So this is a more, let's say, uh, artistic way of demonstrating what we what we saw. But there is another part of this agriculture intensification uh, that could have an important effect on the, on the fire regimes of the systems, which when we open clear these fields, especially during the 2000s, uh, you get this lots of fire in the landscape. And then for many years we'd expect that with soybean expansion would kick fire out of the landscape because we don't need fire in this agricultural systems, uh, but it happened we didn't see, we saw the opposite, an intensification of the fire regime. Probably because when you open this forest, uh, this uh, uh, land, uh, you burn to remove all the, uh, the biomass, and this generates a lot of forest fires. 
And then, um, but right now, we start observing, uh, as you move away from the soybean fields, the probability of fire increases substantially. In other words, uh, it seems that this older uh, soybean fields dominated landscape have already lowered the probability of fires at the landscape scale. But you still have a climate forcing that apparently is more important than this reduction in uh, source of ignition. In other words, we still have lots of fires. So just to uh, finish, still uh, a puzzle, but a very important one, whether agriculture intensification, especially mechanized agriculture, can actually spare land. Um, whether the changes caused by agricultural expansion uh, in climate are large enough to influence uh, the stability of this forest, especially combined with global climate change. And, and how much of this uh, multiple, multiple, multiple disturbances uh, can lead to rapid forest degradation in the region? And what is the size of the problem they were facing? So with that, I'd like to thank you again. Thank you very much, Paolo. That, that was, I think, a great substantive talk to end on. But there must be some comments and questions out there. I know we have questions from the webcast and questions in person. OK, Paolo, um, a few years ago, uh, there was a hypothesis by Arirango and uh, uh, David Kamowitz that the effect of agriculture intensification uh, on deforestation depend whether you were dealing with a high capital intensive low labor uh, situation like pastures or soybeans they, they they would they would increase the deforestation or you were dealing with a high labor intensive things like uh, small scale agroforestry that kind of stuff that that apparently uh, they said would have no no impact on on, on, on deforestation. Is that hypothesis is still still holding? Um, I, 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 well, for the large scale, uh, we, we got to this point that it seems that it had appeared that it, it holds true. But there's, there are very few examples of that we spare in land, right? That we are actually saving forests. And, and in Brazil right now with the small scale, uh, I, think, I think what is happening and then maybe Avery and others can jump in, is that there is a push to intensify this small-scale agricultural systems in the rural settlements in Brazil. And, and, but the problem is that uh, all the lines of credits are for soybean or cattle. So if you have a different system to intensification, uh, no one knows how to deal with that. So you have some billions of dollars available to more sustainable practices in this small scale. But the only intensification that may happen is through the old uh, cattle ranching. Uh, so this is this is one of the problems that it's not only intensify or not, but how intensify the system. And so IPAM is pushing into this direction of can we can we create a shift the paradigm and actually produce things go beyond cattle uh, in this region. Other questions, comments? Yeah, great, great talk, Bella. Super. Um, one I want to go back to the, the land sparing debate argument. And uh, Doug Southgate talked a lot, the economist talked a lot about, um, and I don't know if advocated, but argued about land sparing effects. But it was coupled with uh, enforcement. And you talked in that great slide about the role of Greenpeace and other organizations and satellite telemetry and all sorts of things to help in this enforcement. Where would you say now, uh, in conversations with EPOM and, and the Brazilian government, uh, in terms of progress, progressing towards better enforcement, better property rights, better um, uh, repercussions from violating uh, uh, public lands and things like that. That's a very, very interesting question. So right before going to IPAM, I was going to uh, working with a bunch of, uh, uh, I would say, ecologists, all 
full of clothes with mud and everything. We go there, it seems that you're going to an international relations uh, workshop. But it's working with people in China, working with people in Europe, working with buyers, trying to create more sustainable uh, food supply chains. Uh, and, and, then, and then there's a divide, not within a firm, but I would say with different environmental institutions, saying that the role of the environmental institutions is not to promote intensification. That is happening anyway. There are uh, $100 billion, uh, a little bit less, to invest in improving these agricultural practices already from the private sector. So this is going to happen anyway. So, so we should, as you mentioned, secure the borders, right? Do, if we block this forest uh, according to the law and do not allow for uh, further deforestation, this is going to hap happen naturally. So, so one of the, the important uh, mechanisms that people are putting a lot of eggs in the basket is this registry that is going on. So, so right now, according to this new forest code, uh, all, every single property is required uh, to map the property, the forest, and upload in a in an online system. So you know who is in legal uh, legality and who is illegal, who the forest and who don't, and you can monitor that over space. Right now, we don't know where the property's boundaries are, so you cannot enforce. So this is one of the the mechanisms that the environmental movement uh, is moving towards.